Welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility, an ongoing inquiry into American political origins and evolving institutions. The Executive Director of the Virtual Center is Dr. Bill O'Brien. He's also the host of, your, of this continuing conversation. Here he is now, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Agnes, thank you so much, and welcome everyone to the first live edition of the virtual center that we've done in some time. Uh, it is a pleasure to be an honor to be back with you. Um, had a little bit of a medical setback. I'll, it's nothing, I, well, it's not that serious. I, I guess it's serious for me, but it's not serious for anybody else. But anyway, I'll, I'll mention a few things about it when we get into the program. But um, I miss being on the program so much. And uh, so let me, uh, let me give you some of the basics, if I can remember them. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, because first of all, I would love to hear there's so much going on, uh, to try to put together a program and not knowing where to go, which to cover first is really difficult. I had four or five items or issues that I was looking at, um, the last time we were together and they're still there, but then there's so much else. And of course we, we have a president that keeps everybody hopping, so to speak, and Boy, is he keeping everybody hopping, everybody in the world, it looks like. But welcome to the Virtual Center for Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility. Thank you for your patience and your... You can't, I can't even begin to tell you how much it means to me. I just appreciate the opportunity to be here and share these couple of hours a few days a week with you. That when they're not there, I miss them terribly. Uh, and I want to thank you, and I want to thank Bob and Agnes and folks at Head On for, for kind of putting up with me and hanging in there. And um, it's just a wonderful, wonderful group of people who I think contribute so much to what the country needs right now. And I thank you all for your continued support. We'd love to hear from you on issues, and you pick them. There's so many you can pick. Just go for one. Um, we have, a, we have a phone line directly into our studios at the Head On Radio Network. Agnes is there, and she'll get you on the air momentarily if you choose to, to call. If you're a user of Skype, then if you type on Skype, Bob Kincaid Horn, H-O-R-N, that gives you direct access into the studios. Agnes will get you on the air. If you, you'd rather use your phone or you don't use, you're not a Skype user, then you can call directly into the Head On Radio Network studios. The number is area code 304-574-8178. That's 304-574-8178. I can't believe I remembered that phone number. I can't believe it. Um, I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning, but I can remember that number, so... 304-574-8178. If you'd like to drop me an email and let me go on, take your ideas and put them on the air for you, if you feel more comfortable doing that, I'm honored. I'd be do the very best I can to represent you and share your thoughts with our other listeners. My email address is waobrien906 at gmail.com. That's waobrien, O-B-R-I-E-N, 906, at gmail.com. And again, I do call your attention to our Facebook page. I've put a few things on there over the last four or five days. Um, and uh, in fact, I'll be sharing a few of those things with you today. But I do believe, now that I'm kind of back on my feet, as I really wasn't off my feet, I just... Uh, my feet just weren't moving as fast as they usually do. Um, but I plan to make better use of the Facebook page. And I, I do apologize for those of you who have gotten used to looking at our Facebook page. And you've probably been kind of concerned because it seems like day after day goes by and there's not anything new on there. There's, a, there's been a few things. And I've got a few things more to put on there. In fact, I do want to share some of these thoughts with you. Today, because there are th two or three things that have been really eating at me, and uh, I'll, I'll kind of share with you what uh, what kind of conclusions I reached on those. So, 
there's an awful lot to talk about. I, I, um, I get a kick. I, I don't know. I don't know whether uh, uh, many of you uh, are even familiar with what I am about to say. But in the morning, when Morning Joe ends at nine o'clock, Stephanie Rule takes over on MSNBC, and I like Stephanie. She's got a tremendous background in finance. Um, she was with Goldman Sachs for years before she uh, joined NBC and MSNBC specifically. When she comes on the air every morning at nine o'clock, she usually welcomes everybody by saying hello. And, and then the next line out of her mouth is always the same. We got so much to cover today. And I'm, uh, the reason I'm sharing that with you is because we do. There are so many different things. And I keep thinking, I can't, I really don't have any sense as to how long many of them are going to take. So I think we'll just kind of roll through them. And at any point in time, if you choose to give us a call and kind of focus on one issue or an issue that I haven't touched upon, then by all means, feel free to, to do that. By the way, our Facebook page uh, is very simple. But uh, if, you, if you've never used it, obviously, you don't know. If you go to Facebook at Facebook.com, you'll see a search box at the top of the home page. And if you type in the Virtual Center for Study of the Constitution, you will be into our Facebook page. And you'll see there that there are a number of postings that I've put on there with comment opportunities after, along with you have a box that will say share and another box that says comment. And I want you to know that I'm a regular visitor of our Facebook page. So if you would like to share your thoughts with me personally, then you can do it on our Facebook page by reacting to one of the things that's there or just pushing the comments on one of the postings and putting down whatever it is that you would like to share with me. It's a good way to communicate. It's a lot faster than an email. And to be very honest with you, I'm beginning to see that the, the, the email route is rapidly disappearing. I think Facebook and Instagram and many of these other things are rapidly replacing them. And, of course, Twitter. Twitter was, was very attractive until, uh, as far as I'm concerned at least, until um, the president got into it, learned how to use it learned how to use it to his own, for his own political advantage. And I have kind of, kind of this bias building in my mind against Twitter, when in fact Twitter is the vehicle, not the cause of the issue. So welcome to this live edition of the Virtual Center. On this Monday, today is the 11th day of June. We've missed about a week and a half of programs uh, I do apologize. I mentioned that I would let you know it's not anything secret. It's not anything dire. Um, but I've developed some congestion problems. And many of you know that every once in a while over the years, I tend to be susceptible to bronchitis or congestion or whatever, which which leads me to cough incessantly. And when I get into that mode, as it were, I can't go on the air because I can't stop talking, uh, coughing rather. And the mere, t mere talking, not over that. And I, I just want you to know that it, I hope you'll understand. I have a, I have a cough button. By f I can just flip up the microphone and put us on mute if I'm going to cough. And I try to do that because I don't think any of you want to hear me cough. But I'm not that quick with it, so sometimes I miss it, and I hope you will, you will understand and, and be patient with me. But anyway, whatever this congestion was hit me about a middle of the week last, not this past week, but the week before. And I thought I was taking a cold. In fact, I told my wife, I said, I, I feel like I'm getting a cold. I can just feel my chest filling up with mucus and congestion. And I thought it was a cold. It turned out it wasn't a cold, but it, was, it might as well have been. It was the same thing, but I, there was no head cold, no sniffles, no drainage, none of that stuff. Just directly in my chest, filled up to the point that I couldn't breathe. 
I couldn't stop coughing. I was coughing, trying to get phlegm up, and I couldn't get anything up. It was too tight. I actually, I hadn't done this since I was in my, you know, I was six years old. My dad, when I was young, uh, when I was a kid, I had pneumonia, and it was before penicillin. In fact, it was like a year before penicillin. It was very close, but it was about a year before penicillin was discovered. And I was laid up probably four months with pneumonia. And I've always felt that the heritage, the legacy of that bout with pneumonia when I was six years old has stayed with me ever since. Whenever I get a cold, it kind of hits me in the chest and and uh, I have trouble breathing. And I can remember my dad would uh, would would they would they would boil a pan of water and put the boiling pan of water on the kitchen table, sit me down with a towel over my head, and I would go in there as if it were a tent and inhale boiling water with Vicks vapor rub in it. And it would get it would open up my my nasal passages and stuff so I could breathe. I found myself doing that again this time. I hadn't done it for years. But I went to the doctor and the doctor gave me a number of prescriptions and put me on a steroid. And it it broke the congestion, the worst part of it. But it's taken a while to get rid of the whole thing. But I, I guess I'm, I could say I'm like 80% better than I was, 85% better. And I didn't want to go any longer. I just missed this program so much. To say and talk about. And when there's nobody there to listen, uh, it, it's kind of frustrating. So... So with that, I'd like to uh, get into the program. I'd like to uh, begin our program by touching on an issue that uh, is going on right now, which is, of course, the, the situation of the president's flight to, Shang- to uh, Singapore and uh, Shanghai, rather, and uh, the upcoming uh, summit with uh, Kim, jo- Kim, Jong- uh, Kim Jong-un tomorrow. Um, and I had put, I think, one of the last postings that I put on Facebook, I wrote when President Trump arrived at the G7 in Quebec, Ontario, and um, in Canada. And I had various concerns about the role that he was going to play with the G7. I had no idea as to what would ultimately happen when he left. The attack on on Trudeau, on Pierre Pierre Trudeau. The attack on allies. The condescending way that he's approaching our enemies, Russia and North Korea specifically, contrasted with the brash, arrogant way that he's dealing with our allies. I had a problem several months ago when the focus of his attack was on Mexico and on Mexicans and some of the negative, vile uh, comments that he said about Mexicans, referring to them as breeders. And, you know, the, the, the racial overtones and the ethnic overtones of those kind. I mean, it's just absolutely unbelievable. The fact that it, they, it's unbelievable if anybody said it. The fact that the United States, the president of the United States is saying it makes it an embarrassment for all of us. I think it's hard to tell and it's hard to distinguish or focus on people's reactions to what's going on. It's very, very interesting, but at the same time, very disconcerting. You've got this whole group of outspoken people, and I guess I'm probably considered one of those, who's absolutely furious about what the president is doing to the country, to the history and legacy of the country, to our heritage, to our founders, 
to our people, to the world, to the people of the world. They deserve more. We deserve more. There's a very significant group of Americans who are among that group, who are so turned off and just can't wait for the opportunity to throw the lever and try to do something about this. I guess, from my perspective, the hope is that there'll be enough of those people to make a difference. I don't think it's quite as obvious as it might seem. Because if you constantly interact with people who feel the same way about what's going on, you begin to get a very narrow, uh, sheltered, focused view. And you tend to assume that the people you're hearing from speak for the bulk of the people in the country. That's a dangerous assumption to make. Because there are substantial people in the country, as the polls show, who remain totally loyal to the president and what he's doing. It doesn't mean that they support some of the things he says and some of the things he does. And I think that's important. Many of these people who feel that the benefits they are getting tend to lay low and tend to emphasize the things that they see as positives and not to mention at all the things that are negative. It's very, very difficult for anybody to defend the vocabulary. You know, the, the, the thing that this was going on when, when I stopped doing live programs about a week or a week and a half ago. The, bit, the flap with the NFL and the refusal of the uh, Philadelphia Eagles to go, to go to the White House, so many of them, that since there were only going to be about 10 out of the 90, <clears throat> the president canceled the invitation. With, with an approach and some comments which were very, very controversial. And, of course, what he was trying to do is paint those in the NFL who were protesting, paint them as unpatriotic, paint them as unsupportive, uh, not supportive of our troops. The fact of the matter is that's not what they're about at all. I think LeBron James is probably among the most v visible people that made it very clear that this is not about that at all, that the president is trying to manipulate public opinion and direct it into a place where it ought not to be. The real issue here is race. It's discrimination, primarily against African Americans, principally against African American males. It's about police brutality. It's not an attack on the police. It's not an attack on all of those who are in authority. It's an attack on the behavior of some, not all. And I think that's the issue. And that's what this nation is about. And these people, it seems to me, are exercising rights that all of us must support. We have to support it. To censor these people as the owners of the NFL teams did by saying that the team will be fined if any of its players kneel during the national anthem at next year's games. And if they feel the need to protest, they can stay in the locker room until after the national anthem is over. That's a despicable answer to a complex issue, to a very complex problem. And the reason it's bad is because it provides an excuse to not address the issues themselves. These people have to continue, and I'm 
in my mind, I've got Martin Luther King here because this was his major point. Those who would protest must continue to protest because to silence the protesters is to make it possible for those who would be influenced by the protests to dodge the issue entirely. And nothing gets solved that way. So that, it seems to me, that is, is, is one of the issues. But it's, it's, it's one of, of so many. There are all, there are all of these issues. Let me uh, kind of thumbing through my thumbing through my notes here. Not sure exactly where to go first, but I'll do the the very best I the very best I can. Let's take a moment and just kind of revisit the G7, which is over now. But this is a posting that I put on Facebook a few days ago when the president was at the G7. I thought it was very significant that the president arrived late. I heard one person make a comment, if you're not early, you're late. This idea of arriving right on time with a lot of people doesn't, does, doesn't quite cut it. The president arrived late. The word coming out of the administration was he didn't really want to go anyway. That he was putting all of his eggs in the, in the North Korea basket, so to speak. That was his focus. He sees tremendous opportunity for his own legacy in that meeting with North Korea. Everybody talks about the president of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, and what he's liable to, what he sees he can get out of this meeting, out of this summit. And there's some concern among many that the president is inclined to give away too much too fast. And they want the re reality to be clear to people that the mere, fa mere fact that the summit is even happening is a victory for Kim Jong-il, uh, not Kim Jong-il, excuse me, Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-il, of course, was his, was his father, I believe. So that's the issue. The president didn't want to go to the G7. Our nation's major allies... Last week, we celebrated the anniversary of D-Day, the Normandy invasion. The very people that were with us in that monumental effort were waiting in Quebec for the president to go there. And he was late. And when he did get there, he announced that he was leaving early. The implication being that whatever business these people believed they had to take care of paled in comparison to the important role for the world that he was scheduled to play following the G7. That I find very, very difficult. The president's focus has been on trade and fairness. The posting that I put on Facebook basically addresses that issue. I put it on Facebook on the 8th of June. Today is the 11th, so this would have been late last week. And the reason I... I chose to write something on our Facebook page 
about this issue of the G7, but more specifically, the issue of trade, the, the issues of international free trade agreements like NAFTA and TPP, the international agreements, the military ones like NATO, the environmental ones like the Paris Accords. The fact that the president is pulling this nation out of all of them is detrimental not only to us, but to them, to the, uh, to the others there, because of the role that America plays in the world. The president has been very, very consciously focusing on the fact that the American economy is far and away the largest economy in the world still, in spite of the expansion of the German economy, in spite of the united power of the European Union, in spite of the advances made so rapidly. matter is the United States economy is still huge. The president makes the point that our trade agreements, our participation in these international agreements based on so-called free trade have been at our expense that we've been cheated, that people have been taking advantage of us for years, that they're running surpluses because we're running deficits in terms of trade. The fact that others are imposing tariffs on us, that we haven't had the opportunity to reciprocate with them. And so from this perspective, the president is approaching the G7, uh, G7 and the issues related to trade almost from a perspective of a victim. And the implication is that this has cost us millions and billions of dollars. It has hurt our businesses. It has hurt our farmers. And the president is committed to making sure that this ends. And from now on, what international agreements, trade agreements we enter will be bilateral, will be reciprocal. I think it's very significant that one of the things he's talked about during the renegotiations of NAFTA with Canada and Mexico. The proposal he's making is to split negotiations into two groups. In other words, make one trade relationship with Mexico a totally different one with Canada. In other words, make it bilateral. Which really doesn't totally square with the overall intent and purpose of NAFTA or TTP or any of these others. And that's the reason I put the posting on Facebook. It seemed to me that the years that I've been teaching and doing research in these areas, I felt that I did have something that I might be able to offer Facebook readers which would clarify or put a little bit into perspective the implications of some of the things that were going on. One of the things I've found over the years in teaching, for example, is that the issues of trade and protectionism, tariffs, the idea of commercial fairness and balance are kind of baffling to a lot of people. They are very confusing. 
I know over the years that the idea of protective tariffs have been very confusing for students. It's a little bit, it, it requires thinking that happens at a little bit deeper, more abstract level than many of our young people are used to thinking, if that, that makes sense. In other words, what needs to happen, what the point that needs to be stressed is that we have to realize that in the modern world, trade, commerce is not a standalone concept. It's not an issue that you can deal with separate from other issues. The reason is because the nature of our economy. And this stems, I'm doing a little bit of history here, but I can't help it. This stems from the fallout of the Industrial Revolution. We've touched on these things before, but maybe not in, these, in this context. One of the major impacts of the Industrial Revolution is on the nation that industrializes. Most of the time, when our books are, when people talk about the Industrial Revolution, they're talking about the advantages that industrialism and the application of science to technology brings to non-industrial peoples of the world. In other words, it gives them access to high quality products at lower price because the Industrial Revolution is associated with things like standardized production, universal parts, mass production. In other words, you're reducing the costs of production or development, and you're increasing the quality of items available. And actually, you're producing quality items that in many ways exceed the quality of things produced one at a time. Most people who deal with the Industrial Revolution focus on that aspect of it. In other words, the increase in the quality of life and standard of living that industrialism brings to the non-industrialized world. It contributes to their, to the growth of their civilization. It contributes to an increase in the quality of life. It's tied directly with a, an increased emphasis on education, on good health, on the conquering of disease. Many of these things which are very positive. But as we know, there are negatives associated with it. And most people who look at the negative side of the Industrial Revolution look at the impact it has on the nation that produces, the nation that industrializes. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time into this, but let me just say briefly, I think the major impact in this area as the impact is the impact that the Industrial Revolution has on work itself, on labor, on the worker. When you standardize the production process, you make it less and less personal. You make it much more impersonal. You tamper with or weaken the worker's pride in the quality of the product. No longer is it possible for people working in industry to feel a sense of pride in the products that they're producing. Because in most cases, they aren't producing the entire product. They're producing one small piece of it 
in a much more standard, automatic, artificial context. It depersonalizes the value of work. It dehumanizes the humanity of the people working. You can see examples of this all through our past history since the Industrial Revolution. Examples of people protesting. Examples of people who become so frustrated because they become so machine-like that people don't even consider them to be people anymore. And sometimes individuals rebel against this. It's almost like they're standing up and screaming before their fellow workers and say, I'm here, I have a person, it's me, I'm real, I matter. Because one of the impacts or the implications of industrialism is that the parts are replaceable, the people are replaceable. And so if something happens to you, we can move somebody else in to fill the very limited skill role that you play. So there's very little about working in the industrial process that makes it possible for the individual to feel any sense of pride or accomplishment. That's one of the negatives. On the other hand, there are negatives for the nations who are receiving the benefits of access to these higher quality goods and services. And that is that their way of life is being altered. By definition, the introduction of industrialization into their society, access to industrial products, changes the whole set of priorities that make up their lives. Their cultures change. They become more like us. As they gain access to industrial products, they they become dependent on access to those products, which means they become vulnerable and dependent upon us or the other nations that are producing the industrial products in question. So there are cultural implications to industrialism, not only for us, the industrializer, but those on the receiving end of the products, the industrialese, as if we could create a word. All of that's significant. But the fact of the matter is, all of it is tied up in trade, in commerce. Because by definition, as your society industrializes, as it becomes possible for you to produce more goods of higher quality, cheaper, The only way that this process can continue is with a growing market. You've got to find increased numbers of people who want the products you're producing. Because if there's no market out there, you can't afford to produce. All you produce sits in a warehouse and collects dust. In other words, for industrialism to flourish, there needs to be a constantly expanding market. Not only that, but the industrial process requires power. It requires energy. It requires raw materials. Increasingly, as your industrial capability increases, 
your demand for resources increases as well. You've got to have access to the resources you need in order to maintain the industrial expansion that's underway in your country. What's the issue here? The issue here is interdependency. It's the idea of an international marketplace. It's the degree to which industrialism and the need for commercial expansion overrides national boundaries. It creates linkages or connections between peoples and nations that might not be connected were it not for access to the industrial products and from our point of view, access to the raw materials that many of these non-developed third world parts of the country, of the world, make available to us. By definition, the expansion of free enterprise industrialism necessitates ongoing expansion. That's what capitalism is about. Consequently, the Industrial Revolution creates a situation economically which has clear implications on workers, on international affairs, on foreign policy, on competitiveness among nations, on potential hostility and competition among nations for markets and sources of raw materials. In other words, the realities of an industrial world force changes in a number of different areas, social changes, political changes, religious changes, the quest for material goods and services violates many religious principles that peoples of the world might have. As our, as our own scripture says, material success tends to replace human success. It is a phenomenon which many people believe violates the principle of putting false, false gods before the God that matters. Screwing up your priorities, as it were. People become so focused on material things that they tend to overcome or disregard, ignore, or indeed violate spiritual principles. So there's all sorts of ramifications. What about industrialism itself? When a nation seeks to industrialize or begins to industrialize, it's creating what the textbooks refer to as infant industries, businesses just trying to get off the ground, just trying to become established. But they find themselves thrown immediately into competition with well-established companies who are producing the same things we are. It takes a while for a new producer, a new company, to build a clientele. That means that during this initial phase, this infant industry, as it were, is extremely vulnerable. Its stronger competitors can put, us, put it out of business by underpricing its products. If you go into business producing the same thing I'm producing, 
one thing I can do is lower my prices below the level at which you can possibly offer the product. Since you're new and you're just trying to get started, you don't have price flexibility that I do. So I can so lower the price that consumers, buyers out there, will buy my products rather than your products because they're so much cheaper. Depending on how new and how vulnerable you are, it doesn't take long before that process will put you out of business. So the fact is, how does a nation that seeks to grow all these new industries, how does the nation and its government protect these baby industries until they get established? The way nations do that is with protective tariffs. If I put a tax on manufactured products coming into this country from other countries, then that raises the price of that product because the companies aren't going to pay the tax. The consumer is. If Japan is selling Hondas in the United States for $25,000 and, and I impose a 25% tariff on Hondas coming into the United States for sale, that means that the price of the Honda goes up appreciably. The 25000 that it costs, plus the 25% tariff added on to it, 25% tariff on, on, on $25,000 adds over $6,000 to the price. So suddenly that Honda is selling for th for thirty one hundred dollars rather than twenty uh, for for thirty one thousand dollars rather than twenty five thousand dollars. Well, you can buy a Malibu or a Ford Escape or a Fusion for a lot less than that because they're made here; they don't pay the tariff. So what that means is American consumers are going to buy the cheaper product. What that means is that the tariff is protecting the manufacturers in this country. That's why it's called a protective tariff. It raises the price of the competition in order to force people to buy American-made products, in, in, in our case. The problem is that if I impose a 25% tariff on you, on Hondas made in Japan, Japan's going to turn around and impose a 25% tariff on something that I want to sell in their country refrigerators, televisions, computers, whatever it might be. And so what you end up with is a tariff war where both sides get hurt. That's what President Trump is talking about in his relations with the G7, with Canada and Great Britain and Germany and France and Italy and Japan etc. That's what that's what President Trump is talking about. When he imposes a 25% tax on steel and a 10% tax on aluminum on goods produced in Canada, Canada naturally is going to turn around and retaliate 
with tariffs of its own and what we want to sell there. The result is both sides get hurt. It stands to reason that if we can sit down and work with, negotiate with Canada, we could work out an agreement where neither one of us would be hurting each other. Each of us would be giving in a little bit, and the result would be that we'd all profit, we'd all flourish. That's what drives the idea of these international trade agreements. That if you can get all the major parties involved who would frequently be competitors, if you can get them all to play by the same rules and get them willing to sit down and talk together and negotiate their differences, you can create an optimum situation where everybody benefits and nobody gets hurt. That's the ideal of free trade agreements. The rivalry and the economic hostility involved in these bilateral agreements and potential trade wars is devastating for all the parties concerned. Why? We go back to the original premise. You can't look at trade as separate from anything else. The fact of the matter is citizens in your country under industrialization need jobs. In order to be able to find jobs, good jobs, well-paying jobs with benefits, the economy must be expanding. Business must be growing. There must be a demand for what you make, what your product, the product you make is. When you started playing around with, with, with tariffs, you're infringing on commercial expansion. You're jeopardizing the expansion of commerce. You're tampering with a potentially growing market. It's going to have implications on jobs. If we're no longer able to sell what you make, because another nation has put a, a high tariff on it, then the first impact of that is going to be that you're going to see your hours reduced. You're going to see your overtime hours eliminated. You're going to see full-time employees put on half-time. You're going to see workers laid off. And if workers are getting laid off, or getting their hours reduced, they don't have enough cash to purchase what they need to buy out there. The entire economy suffers because people don't have the cash to buy. And the result is that the impact reverberates throughout your economy, throughout your society. You have an overall economic slowdown, and it impacts on people hardest. And it impacts on the, on the unskills first and the hardest. Because it's usually the unskilled who are making less and don't have the reserve reservoir, the bank accounts, or the, sa the savings that can weather these temporary setbacks. These people are hurt immediately. They have to stop spending. They have to cancel their subscriptions to cable. They have to cash in insurance policies. They have to do whatever they need to do, or they're going to have their cars repossessed, their homes, for the mortgages foreclosed on. 
So what we're looking at here is a phenomenon that is involved in all the aspects of a modern society. That's why this is critical. And there's one more factor that seems to be critical as we examine this issue. And that's the issue of international politics, power and influence. Two things that I think we need to be aware of, because we're hearing a lot of rhetoric which suggests other things. And the fact of the matter is we need to keep our feet planted firmly on the ground so that we know what the facts are. President Trump is implying when he talks about how we're being cheated and being taken advantage of, he made the comment at the, right after the G7 that the United States has been like the piggy bank that everybody takes money out of. We've been the sucker. And President Trump says it's over. We're going to demand fair treatment, etc. The point that I made in my posting is that what he is doing is assuming or implying something that is not true. Namely, President Trump is implying or assuming that the whole issue here, the only thing that matters, is the bottom line, profit and loss. His argument is that if other nations are getting advantages more lucrative than we're getting, that's because we're being cheated. The assumption is, if our competitors, our rivals, are benefiting more than we are, the implication is that's coming directly out of our pocket. And the only way you can determine the success of our trade, our commercial policy, is by looking at the bottom line. Are we in the black or are we in the red? If others are in the black, Trump is saying, that means we're in the red. If we're in the black, they're in the red. The implication here is that this is a bottom line, zero-sum game. And you only measure it by surpluses and deficits. The fact of the matter is that's not true. And for the president to imply that it is true is deceitful. It's wrong. On a superficial level, the most superficial level, it makes sense because on the surface, it's unfair. But the fact of the matter is there's a whole lot more involved in it than that. And that's the nature of the world and the world economy and the standard, of the, the standard of living throughout the world. Since World War II, the United States has been able to establish a position of power and influence in the world that is greater than any one nation has ever had before. With the fall of the Soviet Union and the defeat of the Axis powers in World War II, the United States came out of the 1940s as the most powerful, the most vibrant economy in the world. We literally controlled so much of the world's productivity that we really drove the international economy. The implication the president is making is that beginning around 1980, if you will, we started to be taken advantage of. We were the suckers. 
And that's what he's committed to ending. The numbers tell us that that's not true. Gross national product in the United States continued to grow faster than any other nation in the world from the end of World War II all the way up to the recession in 2008. And in fact, part of the recovery that I think all of us must give due credit to to Barack Obama and his administration. We have reestablished ourselves from the recession to where once again we are producing at a level above everybody else. The implication that the president is making is when other nations began to take it Our economy suffered. We were taking in less money. We were running huge deficits to the benefit of our competitors. The fact of the matter is totally opposite that. Our gross national product continued to grow. What am I saying? I am saying that the international situation that the United States was able to put together after World War II into the late 20th century, especially with the fall of the Soviet Union in the late 80s and early 90s, put the United States in a position of not being challenged anymore. We were number one unquestioned. What that means is in order to keep this system going, in order to keep this international framework operative so that our GNP continued to expand as it had consistently since World War II, the United States had an investment. Economists refer to it as the legitimate costs of doing business. If we're losing money in relationships with Canada in the area of dairy, for example, dairy products, what we need to look at is where we're deriving benefits in other places. What are the advantages? of the open border we have with Canada? What are the advantages of the tens of millions of tourists who cross back and forth between the two countries on a regular basis and bring money and business into each of the countries? What are the advantages in some of the other areas of production and trade? to isolate a particular area like timber or steel or aluminum or dairy products is narrow and short-sighted. It not only doesn't give you a clear picture of the whole situation, it gives you a distorted picture of the whole situation. The fact of the matter is, even if the United States was losing money in certain areas of the international trade situation, we were more than offsetting that with gains in other areas. We were calling the shots for nations around the world. We were controlling the World Bank. We were controlling the International Monetary Fund. We were overseeing and managing the industrialization and the development of non-developed countries in Africa, Asia, and Central America. We were investing and building in new markets and new sources of raw materials. We were guaranteeing that our industrial machine would be able to continue to produce at high levels. We were guaranteeing the continued growth and expansion 
of our growth national product. We were guaranteeing the expansion and continued creation of new and more challenging jobs. We were generating the kind of economic growth and flexibility that gave us the opportunity to invest in infrastructure, in education, in health, in science. We were literally put in a position of being able to lead the world in directions that we wanted to go in, consistent with values that we wanted to see the rest of the world adopt. That's not free. That's not something you can just take for granted. That's the very basis of our prosperity. President Trump is ignoring that. He doesn't want us to see it. He's focusing on the chits, if you will. He's focusing on how many chips Canada gets as opposed to the number of chips we get. That's narrow, it's blind, it's self-serving, and it's wrong, and it's dangerous. That's the reason I put the post on Facebook. Because once you take in the whole picture and begin to appreciate what's really going on here and what's been going on here for the last 65 and 70 years since World War II, you can begin to realize how detrimental, how short-sighted and how stupid the commercial policies being pursued by the Trump administration are. And the fact that he's been able to eliminate all of the people within his administration who was, would call his attention to this. He's been able to replace McMaster with John Bolton. He's been able to take to replace Roy Cohn, Goldman Sachs, with Peter Navarro, who's one of these notorious protectionist people who flourished at the time of World War I. We've grown way beyond Peter Navarro. We've grown way beyond that narrow, self-interested, self-serving perspective that Peter Navarro brings to the economy. President Trump got rid of Roy Cohn, got rid of McMaster, got rid of Rex Tillerson in secre as Secretary of State, and has replaced them with sycophants, yes men who are saying exactly what he wants to hear. For Peter Navarro, to come out and respond to the comments that Pierre Trudeau made at the closing of the G7 and call them a stab in the back and make a statement that there's a special place in hell for people who stab their friends in the back like Trudeau did to President Trump is ludicrous. It's wrong. The only thing that bothers me, the only question I have in this whole thing, and I know the answer is going to come out, it's just going to take a while. Everybody's talking about the fact that these people are springing to the defense of Donald Trump. And the focus of the media is why is Donald Trump taking the position he is with the G7, with his allies, one would think that with the summit coming up with North Korea, with Kim Jong-un, he would be interested in marshalling all his allies, all his support behind him, so he could negotiate from a position of strength. 
his narrow self-serving approach towards strength is that if he goes over there and makes the point that he's he's kowtows to nobody that he'll walk out of Paris Accords and G7s and TPPs and NAFTAs and he'll do whatever it does to serve him in his mind that's strength and it seems to me it leads to one logical question Whatever the summit with Kim, Ong, Kim, Il, Kim Jong Un produces, if you were Kim Jong Un, if you were the president of North Korea, would you feel comfortable in trusting any agreement that you reach with Donald Trump when he's just done this to his allies and embarrassed them all before the face of the world, before the world? What Trump has done is establish himself as short-sighted, narrow, selfish, schizophrenic, narcissistic, whatever you want to call it. He has sent the message to North Korea that he can't be trusted. And they're going into the meeting with him from a position we better get as much as we can get because it's obvious from the past weekend that we can't afford to trust this guy on anything. I would suggest to you that's frightening. I've gone way over. It's now 11, it's 11 minutes after the hour. So we are almost 25% of the way into our second hour. But I do want to pause and take our break because uh, I, I need one, to be honest with you. That took a little bit longer, a little bit more involved than I anticipated. You're listening to the Virtual Center for Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility. We're going to pause for a three or four minute break, and then we'll come right back and, and we'll launch into what's left of our second hour. What I'd like to begin with in our second hour, if it's okay, and again, when I say if it's okay, if you have comment that you would like to make about the things we've talked about already or other things that you would like to raise and you would like to get on the phone, or on your computer and use Skype and get directly into our studios and come on the air. Then let me know. Let me real, let you let me tell you that you are more than welcome to do that. If that doesn't happen, if where we go in the second hour is left totally up to me, I'd like to share with you a couple of the issues that I've been playing with over the last several days. And, I, and, and, and give you some perspective on where I'm coming from and what my issues are. Because I think these are issues that we're going to be dealing with in the near future. So again, you are listening to the Virtual Center for Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility. We're going to pause, pause for three or four minute break. We'll be right back. Please stay with us.
return to the virtual center for the study of the Constitution and civic responsibility. Here's your host, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Thank you, Agnes. I uh, we didn't take that long a break today. I'm a little bit a uh, little bit uncomfortable because we ran so far over into our second hour, and I I shouldn't have done that. But on the other hand, I got kind of got carried away. I I was sitting there thinking to myself during the break while I was listening to the music. I may have trouble breathing, but I don't have trouble sweating. I'll tell you, I, I'm I'm fired up now, but let me buddies, let me tell you. Ah, it's wonderful to be back, and I thank you so much for your tolerance and patience uh, in putting up with me uh, uh, during during these things. I I hope that <clears throat> that I'm able to put together programs that really make you feel that you've that that this is a a worthwhile investment of your time. I know how valuable your time is. It is to all of us. I, as I get older, I appreciate that more and more. That so little of it left. But uh, if you keep tuning in day after day, then you are basically sending me a message, whether you realize it or not, that this this value to be realized in tuning into our program and participating in our programs. And the fact that you even think that is really what motivates me, and I thank you so much for it. For those of you who are just joining us, welcome. We spent our first hour talking about the issues of trade and commerce and protective tariffs and all the rest of it that have been such a factor at the G7. We also opened the program by making, uh, I made some comments about the president's behavior and the behavior of those who advise him. It frightens me, to be very honest with you, that the, the Roy Cohns and the Tillersons and the McMasters are gone to be replaced by the Boltons and the Navarros and the, and the uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the people that just basically say what they're expected to say and find ways to kowtow and tiptoe around and not irritate the president. It's almost like they're we hear the analogy all the time. It's like dealing with a child. But you're, it's almost like you're dealing with a time bomb that can go off at any time. It's, it's frightening, absolutely frightening. We would love to hear from you. Let me go back and give you the details of how you might do that. If you are a user of Skype, you can go on Skype and type Bob Kincaid Horn. And that will get you directly into our studios and Agnes will get you on the air. If you'd rather use your phone, or if you're not a user of Skype, then there's a direct phone line into our studios. Just dial area code 304-574-8178. That's 304-574-8178. If you'd feel more comfortable sending me an email and sharing your thoughts with me that way, I'd be more than happy to hear from you and do the very best I can, I can to get your ideas on the air for you. Because the most important thing is that what's going through your mind is shared with our other listeners, whether you do it or whether I do it. The most important thing is that one of us does it. Some, some, somebody does it. So I'm willing to do that. My email address is waobrien906 at gmail. Dot com. That's W A O'Brien O B R I E N nine oh six at Gmail dot com. And again I make a reference to our Facebook page, which is where the posting that I focused the first hour on came from. If you go to Facebook, Facebook dot com to the home page, you'll see a search box at the top. Type in the Virtual Center for Study of the Constitution, and you will be onto our Facebook page. And there is, associated with every posting on that Facebook page, there is a comment link that you can click on. And that sends a comment directly back to me. Obviously, the implication or the assumption is that the comments will be related to the posting in which they appear. But that's your call. Once you hit the comment button, you can say anything to me you want. And so it doesn't have to be 
on the issue related to that particular posting. So there are a number of ways that you can interact or communicate with us. And again, I want to thank you for your continued support, your tolerance, your patience. Thank you so much. I, I mentioned at the end of the last hour, just before we took our break, short as it was, that there are a couple of issues that have been kind of churning around in my mind for three or four days. And I spent the last day, day and a half, if you will, committed to the idea that I would start to put some of this on writing, in writing. I would, at, at first blush, I would get these ideas, however well they were put together on Facebook. And then if they bore fruit, which I really do think they might, that I would write something a little bit more formally and begin to send them to the, our local Gazette or local Beckley paper here in southern West Virginia or whatever. And years that we've been on is that there's an advantage of having taught as many years as I've taught that I really probably haven't appreciated as much as I should. And that is that over the years, I've done research in so many different areas for purposes of putting classes together and sections of courses together that it seems like as issues come up on, the, on a national level, I can go back and I have something that I did on that. I mean, the first hour today on trade, on commerce, on the impact of the Industrial Revolution, on the relationships between trade, manufacturing, jobs, economic growth, GNP, quality of life, all of these things, how they all interact. All of that comes from the fact that for many years I've been teaching this stuff with the onset of the Industrial Revolution. The onset, historically, of the modern nation state in Western Europe. And one of the things I didn't mention in our first hour, which I think is a factor here, although it's, it's not directly pertinent to the issues we were dealing with, is the role of government in its relationship business. Obviously, if the power and influence of the nation is directly connected to the strength and the vibrancy of the economy, then that creates, by definition, a very close relationship between government and business. Government cannot be the enemy of business. Government, in fact, must be a supporter of business. Because if business is going to be able to do business around the world, it needs the auspices of America's foreign policy apparatus in order to be able to do it successfully and peacefully. So I think that's a factor that needs to be considered as well. One of the things that came out of beginning in the 20th century, one of the things that came out of the so-called progressive period when government began to interject itself as kind of the honest broker between working people and their employers, and began to promote the idea that both sides could trust government, as Theodore Roosevelt said, government would be responsible for making sure that both sides got a square deal, that both sides were treated fairly. Government would be the umpire. The result of that has led people to believe that government must necessarily operate on the side of working people against business. That there's this innate hostility, rivalry, distrust, if you will, between government and business. The fact of the matter is it's important to recognize that while some of that is true, the fact of the matter is business needs government and government needs business. Their relationship is reciprocal. As trade becomes increasingly international, business can't function 
without the support of government. On the other hand, government's ability to remain popular with its own people demands that business be successful. Because when business is successful, the economy grows. When the economy grows, people can find jobs. Quality of life is good. And when that happens, government is given the credit for it. The fact that the economy has been so good since President Trump came into office obviously is not totally you know, uh, the result of President Trump. The fact of the matter is this economy has been expanding for, for better, than, better than two years before President Trump even came into office. He's benefiting from economic expansion and economic reforms that were initiated during the Obama period. He doesn't like to acknowledge that. He's doing everything he can do to overturn them and undo them and, and negate them. But the fact of the matter is the, 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 the answer, the result is obvious, it seems to me. So all of these things factor in. I mentioned that there were a couple of issues that I've felt the need to deal with. You remember, and we, we'll be back to this. We haven't totally abandoned this issue at all. When we were on before, before I stopped doing live programs about a week and a half ago, we were focusing principally on the degree to which corporations were at war with public education. We even spent one class, one program, as I remember, talking about higher education. I want to go back and revisit that. We talked about the influence of the Cokes and other big business on making donations to higher education institutions who saw their budgets being cut by Republican-controlled legislatures and were offsetting budget cuts with the influx of private and foundation money coming from the private sector. And what we were talking about is the influence that the private sector is able to exert over higher education because of the higher education's dependence on this revenue, on this flow of revenue, operating capital, if you will. So we, we, we spent a program talking about that. I do want to get back to it because I don't think we've totally satisfied that issue at all. But the fact of the matter is there's more going on than just the relationship between corporate America and public education or between that and higher education. There's the issue of working people. There's the issue of unions. There's the issue of the right of working people to participate not only in the businesses, in the products that they contribute to producing, but also in the quality of life in the nation of which they are such a vital part. The nature of our participatory system, the nature of our republic, is that there must be avenues for all citizens to participate in the political process, to be heard. Everybody must have an opportunity to have their voices and their opinions heard. Because what we found is that when a society refuses to listen to a group of people, they become desperate and many times do things which are counterproductive to the best interests of the whole society. I'm the best example, the most recent example I can give you of that is President Trump's election in 2016. Nobody thought he had a chance. But on the night of the election, we found that states, which Democrats were believed were solid for them, 
Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Virginia wasn't solid, but but the think Democrats believed they had a good chance there. Went for Trump. And what the analysts, what political scientists have been doing as they go back over the election to try to figure out what happened and why it happened, is that there were significant portions of our society that felt that they weren't being heard, that felt that they were being taken advantage of or ignored. Working people, white male working people, relatively or largely uneducated, unskilled. These were the people that held the jobs that in massive numbers were being displaced as a result of the technological revolution and the so-called information revolution. And the jobs that were being created, and they are there, require a skill level of sophistication that many of these people don't have the training and the education to be able to successfully take advantage of them. So unlike past situations in our history, when jobs are constantly being displaced or replaced with other jobs, this time is different. Because the people that are losing their jobs, for the, for the most part, are not capable of securing new jobs. The result has been that they've been forced to take unskilled jobs. They've been forced to take service sector jobs. They've been driven into part-time jobs with no benefits. The quality of life has been affected. And one of the things we need to deal with is the reality that of all the wealth that's been created since the recession in 07 and 08, almost all of it has gone to the upper 1%. There's tremendous profit being made, but it's not profit, you, profit that's being distributed or appreciated throughout the society. People who are ter- hurting are continuing to hurt. And we've talked about the extent to which President Trump and his campaign managers were able to spot that opportunity and take advantage of it. And they've been able to use social media to do it. They've been able to employ organizations, outfits like Cambridge Analytica and indirectly Facebook and Twitter. They've been able to organize and communicate with this forgotten group. And what we've learned is that that group is large enough and significant enough that it was able to put Donald Trump in the White House. The fact of the matter is this has created a tremendous hole, a tremendous void I think, in our political fabric, and this is where I'm going. This is one of my one of my pet issues, if you will. It's very obvious that significant people aren't being heard. It's also very obvious that the support for President Trump is at least in part, how big a part is, we, we're not quite sure of yet, but in part is attributable to the fact that Donald Trump is, is able and willing and has a track record of being able to stick the proverbial finger in the proverbial eye of the power structure of the establishment. Consequently, people support him, irrespective of what he does, what he says, or what he insults, whether in fact he's running roughshod over our traditions and our values and our principles and our heritage and all the rest of it, we we can talk about that all we want. The fact of the matter is we've got to find a way to make the reforms necessary to rekindle the opportunity for people 
to participate meaningfully in our society again. If we expect them to support it, if we expect them to participate in it, if we expect them not to support people like Donald Trump, who are out to destroy it, then we've got to give these people not only the opportunity to be heard, but we've got to give them the message that what they have to say is something that we want to hear and something that we realize we must hear. All of this, it seems to me, is significant. I think our system, our political fabric, if you will, has been wounded, seriously wounded, in that we have reached a point where certain groups of people have become so influential that vast numbers of our society have receded into the shadows. And what we're hearing, we're hearing from people from very particular situations. And we've allowed ourselves to drift into a situation where significant portions of our population either are not being heard or believe that they're not being heard. And a lot of this is a matter of faith. People have to believe they matter. That's why they have to be able to find a job. That's why they have to be able to find a job that brings them some satisfaction, some sense of worth, some sense of accomplishment, some sense of independence, even pride. So what's happening to our job situation is not just an isolated issue. It impacts a number of other issues that make for the functioning of our society. Like trade, which we spent the first hour on. You can't look at trade, at commerce, as an issue totally separate from all the other issues around it. Neither can you look at this. It seems to be important. My point. Throughout our history, even before industrialism, but most specifically after it, organized labor, unions, were a major vehicle in giving working people the opportunity to be heard. It's very important that all of us appreciate the fact that unions are not just organized groups of workers intended principally to get as much as they can for the workers at the expense of the employers. The bottom line, economics, dollars and cents, is not just alone what this is all about. Unions have provided a, an important vehicle in our society for the voice of working people to be heard. Europe has recognized this. That's not the word. I'm, I'm, I'm losing contact with the word. The provisions which began in Germany and now extend throughout Europe, that working people must be represented on corporate boards. The voice of the people who work in particular industries must be heard because their perspective is important in the overall decisions affecting industry and the direction that the economy is going to go. In this country, we've never realized that. From the very beginning, 
employers seemingly have been on a mission to destroy unions, to make the case that the collective nature of unions is contradictory to the principles of individual freedom on which our system is based. Pointing out the contradictions, if you will, between individualism and collectivism. And the argument is that the power of unions somehow is un-American. And what makes American American is the right of the individual to speak and be heard. And so throughout the history of organized labor in this country, there has been a counter move by industry to contradict this, to destroy unions as being un-American, as being contra contrary to the purposes and the values of what this free society is about. Working people made tremendous advances in this country during the progressive era at the beginning of the 20th century. Administrations like those of Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson went out of their way to enact legislation that brought working people into the, plot, into the process into political and social legitimacy in this country. When World War I ended, when the United States of America refused to join the League of Nations, when the United States made the decision to go its own way rather than to work in tandem with our allies in creating a post-war world committed to avoiding the kind of Holocaust, the kind of disaster that was World War I. The United States and its businesses, corporations, began to undertake a concerted campaign to do everything that they could do to weaken unions, to weaken the right of working people to organize. In 1905, during the height of the progressive period, the Supreme Court heard a case called Lochner versus New York. We've mentioned this before. Lochner versus New York was a case involving bakery workers. And the rationale behind the law, it was a New York law, the rationale behind the law was that the state government of New York, the state of New York, as part of its police power, its right to protect the quality of life, the safety, and the security, and the health of the citizens of New York had the right to create legislation which would control and regulate the working conditions of people in the baking industry. And, of course, this expanded into other industries as well. One of the companies involved, the baker, Lochner, wanted to fight the legitimacy, the constitutionality of that law, and he did so in the Supreme Court. And by a five to four decision, the Supreme Court ruled that the state law in New York regulating the hours of employment for bakery workers, limiting them to 10 hours a day, 60 days a week, uh, 60 hours a week, was unconstitutional. That it violated the rights of not only the employer,
but the rights of the workers as well. Part of the right to be free, the court argued, was the right to contract independently with your employer. That part of the freedom that was America was the right of employer and employee to sit down together and negotiate the hours and the terms of employment. And that state government had no right to interfere with that freedom. It interfered with the freedom of the worker, and it interfered with the freedom of the employer as well. Consequently, it was a violation of the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment under the Constitution. The fact of the matter is, and one of the dissenting judges, Oliver Wendell Holmes, realized very quickly that this justification for this decision by the majority was a ruse, was a farce. What Holmes realized was that this was an opportunity by corporations, by the employers, to impose a particular economic theory on the Constitution of the United States. That instead of doing what was right for the benefit of the working people, what this decision did was strike down the law as a violation of the value system driven by the idea of individual freedom. That what the court was doing, in effect, was saying the right of the employee to freely negotiate with his employer, the right of the employer to free neg freely negotiate with the individual employee, is a right consistent with the values and the principles of our founding fathers. The right of the state to come in and pass a, pass a law which regulates these terms violates the Constitution of the United States. What Oliver Wendell Holmes pointed out was this decision by the majority was in fact an effort to impose free enterprise capitalist theory, economic theory, on the Constitution of the United States. The court did not have the power to do this Oliver Wendell Holmes said, the court does not have the authority to impose a particular economic theory on the Constitution of the United States. Corporations were reverting back to the principles of the founding in order to thwart or to resist government efforts to improve the working conditions of working people. Worker organizations to represent the interests of workers. All of this was in violation of the principles of individual freedom on which our political system was based. In 1905, the court showed its conservatism by upholding the values of the founding and denying government the right to regulate the private economy and working conditions of working people. But as the progressive movement went on, that changed. And state after state, and eventually the national government itself, began to pass regulatory regulations regulating the production of food, the development of prescription drugs, the safety, the safety of the workplace, the health, safety, and security of housing establishments. 
police protection, fire protection. All of these things became public matters because the driving force of progressivism was that government did have a responsibility to promote the public interest, the general welfare. And government, therefore, had not only the responsibility but the right to enact legislation which would create the kind of working and living conditions in this country which made it possible for maximum numbers of people to flourish, to do well. And that became the progressive movement. When the progressive movement ended and the nation reverted to a much more conservative set of philosophical principles in the 1920s, best examples, the election of Warren G. Harding and Calvin Coolidge as presidents of the United States in 1920 and again in 1924. And then in 1928, the election of Herbert Hoover. <coughs> what the American electorate was saying was that we've had enough of this progressivism. We've had enough of these union strikes and violence. We are, we've had enough of communist socialist radicals coming into the country and infiltrating our labor movement and instigating labor strikes all over the country. We want to go back to a situation that was normal, the good old days. Warren G. Harding wrote, ran his 1920s campaign from his, you know, from, uh, from the position that he supported a return to normalcy. Part of that normalcy was to undo the advantages that organized labor had begun to re realize during the progressive era. In 1914, under Wilson, Congress enacted pro-labor legislation, which gave unions the right to organize, to collective bargain, and to strike. Unions called it Labor's Magna Carta. That's the same legislation that FDR, Franklin D. Roosevelt, enacted as part of his New Deal in the 1930s under the Wagner Act of 1935, giving unions the right to organize, to collective bargain, and to strike. Corporate priorities in the 1920s, then, were focused on undoing or reversing some of the victories and some of the advantages that progressive political leaders had been able to grant to organized labor during the progressive era. Twenties began to promote and advertise the idea of the open shop, making the case that it was unfair and a violation of individual freedom to force a working person that the American way was to give the individual worker the opportunity to join a union, but not make the job itself contingent on it. They called this the American plan. It was allowing labor to organize, but doing so consistent with the principles and the values of the founders. The next step that corporations adopted was the adoption of so-called yellow dog contracts, where in order to get a job, 
a worker had to sign a contract that he would never join a union or that he would never support a union in his place of employment. That was part of the corporate war effort against unions. It didn't stop there. In the mid-20s, major corporations like General Motors, U.S. Steel, began to adopt policies and programs which increasingly operated under the label of welfare capitalism. The message, working people don't need to join unions or belong to unions. Rather, they can depend on their employer to provide what they need without organizing against their employer to get it. Corporations began to offer medical services, pension plans, vacations, insurance programs. The idea was to encourage the individual worker to be dependent on the employer rather than on organizing with other workers. Yet another factor that corporations begin to offer workers during the 20s was stock options, where corporations made it possible for working people, for employees, to buy stock in the company, to give them a vested interest in free enterprise, in capitalism, <clears throat> to put them in a position where when the company benefited, they benefited. All of this designed to discourage workers from turning to unions. That was just the beginning. We're experiencing in today's world under Donald Trump a whole new initiative designed to weaken and ultimately destroy the ability of working people to organize. And I think we're going to have to put that off until our next program. We've reached the end of our time together today. It is the top of the hour. I want to thank you so much for being with us, for your willingness to continue to support the program. For Bob Kincaid and Agnes at Head On, I'm Bill O'Brien, thanking you so very, very much. I hope you have a great day. Enjoy. Keep your eye on the summit, 9 o'clock in the morning. One day it's going to be from what they are reporting. This is Bill O'Brien. Thank you so very much. Be kind to each other. We'll be back tomorrow. Remember, we're not beginning late anymore. We'll begin our tomorrow program same time as today, 1 p.m. in the East. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.